It's the second presentation from uh, Professor Lee. Uh, I'm also, I was uh, uh, one of the team members uh, for this particular theme. Professor Lee, please. I usually like to stand there, you know, but obviously I have to stay here so you can hear my voice. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming to this uh, talk. And uh, this is a logistic-related uh, SIM-based project. And uh, obviously, you can see we, we already finished last year, namely one year ago. So actually, I'm retired already. <laughs> so I'm currently still working in USC, but I'm retired. Professor James Wen will also make a presentation. He also retired from Hong Kong U already. <laughs> He's working in CDU, and Jin will be here. Uh, we make a presentation. We have also other team members here, so you are welcome to ask a question to any one of them. And, okay, so today's presentation, I will still follow academic standard type, you know, introduction and remember what's our major account and uh, what value is uh, if not the same best product? Because I know some of you are maybe young researchers and you are looking for the future, you know, how do you write the proposal? And if, I, if I have time, I will share with you the project management experience. I have excellent team, you know, we work very close together. We have industry support, we are, we are very happy. I'm personally very happy, appreciate all their support here. So if I have time, I will share with you our, my project experience. Okay, so introduction. This introduction was, the slider was done six years ago, but I personally believe still work here, okay? So, the previous speaker talking about the New York and London, okay? New York and London already, you know, evolved from the port city into the so-called modern financial information. Rotterdam still fit, depend on physically, okay? So, <coughs> what is Hong Kong? Okay? We personally, we, we, our team feel that we should follow the mixed model. Namely, we should still focus in physical flow, but also keep us foundation for information service and also financial for another foundation. Okay? So, from an academic point of view, why this is important? Okay? Modern time, Economic already took very many years, but they are focused more like do a survey and then do, do the future trend. In operation research, because we are from operation research, many, many science point of view, still focus in the so-called traditionally in the so-called container terminal operation improvement. Actually, I personally worked with Hutchison for many years before I started this project. So this project is not only terminal operation, we focus in the so-called supply chain. Because many, many issues like revenue management, contracting, MD container, all this kind traditionally traditional focus in terminal operation didn't talk about. We focus in this one, okay? So we will do this one. Then the next question you may ask is, so what is the difference? Because in revenue management, you know, all this kind contracts, really, Air cargo, air, air industry already did a lot, air, air industry. So what's the difference between air industry and the uh, ocean container transport industry? Actually, you can see that in this industry, we are long lead time, okay? We are fragmented and high fixed cost. If you want to buy a new ship, take a few years to come. And a terminal, of course, is very expensive. You, know? you want to build a terminal, take many, many years. And uh, unlike an airline, is some difference. For example, in elastic, in terms of demand and the pricing, okay, and the capacity. For example, why you like a KC Pacific or whatever? Because they are good service. In ocean container logistics, who cares? If I want to ship from here to New York, they may take a, a, another port as long as they arrive on time. Am I right? For, for, for the airline industry, if I want to go to uh, New uh, San Francisco, they take away to somewhere and then call. Although they're on time, I don't like. Service is uh, very important. But, and and uh, if you have good service, if you have good, in, in here means price in elastic. For example, Christmas coming, suppose Christmas coming, and then, then you need to ship. No matter how expensive you have to ship. Understand? If you want to buy an apple, and apple is very expensive, then you don't buy. 
it, it allows it. However, in air car, in, in the container car industry, in the last demand, namely, no matter price, it's there. So that's why price is so frustrating. I, I will share with you this one. And also, price, and also, limited differentiation service. So eventually, people emphasize in cost. And you can see the ship, the ship is come bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. The speed comes slow and slow and slow. Why slow? Because slow, uh, the, the uh, uh, consumption in the energy is, is low. And its cost is low. And the ship becomes bigger, bigger economy of scale. So this is total different, you know. So, so our, our major goal is two part. Obviously, this is UGC support, RGC support. You have to do the global excellence. You have the publication in the top journal, US do and so international excellent. You remember this morning they mentioned international excellent. But you also need to have local impact. This is same base, you have to local impact. So this is the two, you know, and these two together is quite challenge. Quite challenge. Especially from engineering, from the management point of view, it's quite challenging. Okay? So I will share with you how we do, you know. So today. As I mentioned, we are excellent team here. And you can see that some of them are already changed job. Some of them go to Oslo, some go to CTU, and uh, James one already on Hong Kong U, but now he is in CTU after retire. And I am retired already, but I still work in university. And Homing, when we do our project, he was in CTU, uh, Chinese U, but eventually he was in CTU doing the project. So it's cool. And our team is excellent. We have international team. We have the collaboration in Busan because I I got I'm home because the Rotterdam Netherlands is the biggest uh, big port and uh, Busan also, you know. And uh, eventually, if I have time, I will share with we collaborate with all international, Singapore, Denmark, you know, UK, all oh, oh, of them later. Okay. So this is the basic of our strategy. We have technical planning, strategic planning and a sticket future direction. This means a government policy. As James will present and uh, share with you, and of course, you also decision support for, for industry and so on. So. And uh, Ji-Hing will present this part later. So I will share with you probably these two parts, more like uh, you know, our, our academic research come. So our approach is, as I mentioned, we have four types. So technical planning, strategic planning, strategic more like traditional supply chain, revenue management, so the country, and a structural different direction in the future. And also integrated decision support system. So I'm going to share with you our major research results. Okay, research and publication, dissemination, and training the junior researcher. That's obviously, this is very important. And then James will talk about policy, and then industry impact will be given with be then. And then if I have time, I will come back to, to share with you. So obviously, you know, from academic point of view, obviously, you know, you have to publish paper. This is not important. I think every single base has to publish paper. And uh, the important thing is we not only do classical terminal, we did extensive supply chain. For example, the first paper published in our in our field, in the so-called French journal, you know, operation research just appear. It's talking about if you are a shipper, you want to choose a carrier. Some carrier are slow, some carrier are faster. Faster obviously charge more and then slow charge less. But this type of problem, which one should you choose? This is in transportation area, people do it already. On the other from supply chain point of view, when you arrive, if you arrive earlier, you can have high selling price. If you arrive late, then maybe you know, nobody will buy. So this kind of time issue in the GN, this is more supply chain management issue. This paper is think about both. Totally together. So case demand and uncertainty, delivery time and so on. So, so this paper just published. Another paper, for example, in the country. Okay? In the shipping industry, you can have a long uh, one year contract, like Walmart, they usually one year contract, fixed price. You can also go to spa market. Spa market is changing, yeah? So the question is, should you use the fixed price or spa market? And I talked to all CEO, you know, CEO, and they say, you know, they, they want to ask people more move from spa market to the contract uh, fixed price, because fixed price is good for company. The company is saying, no, no, I don't want, why? Because I'm not the owner of the, of the company, I'm only executive. 
And then if the supermarket going down very low, and then I fix the price, then I will be fired. Okay? So they don't want, then, then the, the issue is that, can we share the risk? Then do you still fix the country one year? However, if the supermarket is very low, we share the risk. Co friction. If the supermarket is going up, it's okay. You, you still can do that. For example, this is the paper. Now, of course, we also publish, uh, we also edit in a book, you know, in this area because we want focus supply chain, and we also have the survey paper. This is based on the judge panel, you know, they ask us to do it. So, so we, we accomplish all this kind of, I think this, academia is important. So we only, not only extend to the class, uh, to the supply chain, in the classical problem, we also do actually quite well because we also, we also extend significantly strengthen the classical, improve the classical research area, okay? For example, this paper also in our field, also the, the French journal, it's going to appear or formally or separated. And you can see, I'm not trying to brag, you know, how good this one. You can see, it's very unusual in case, in my whole career, usually we submit the top journal, usually the first one is either reject or major review. The first one is the two minor revision, both. And you can see this very, very encouraging. You know? so, so that's why I think, you know, in, academically, we still need to do this one. And in the second review, it also very good. It's not only extend, but also do much more. You know? So this is quite encouraging. You know? So this is uh, some of them. And uh, another one is, for example, Minzu and, and, and uh, Professor Chi is here today. This is a proposed, uh, paper also got a war all this kind. Okay, so this is also very encouraging in terms of academic research. Okay, and of course we also need to do dissemination, academic dissemination. For example, we give a more than 10 kilo speech. We also invite by presenting in all different countries, like the UK, Netherlands, Denmark, France, Singapore. All these are very important for city for country. So this is. I think it's important. The audience also include all kinds of you know, include government, policy maker, include industry, and even e-commerce, you know. Okay, actually I gave a talk in the Alibaba China, you know, for their senior executive. All this one. So you can see that. And uh, of course we also need to do dissemination. We host the international conference. In this conference we have more than 140 participants and 30 from senior executive in industry. Okay, and also 10 from Korea. And we also conduct an industry workshop. I think this is necessary, you know, we cannot do that. But Professor James Wong and myself, we also have one day workshop for, for academic, and we also, I personally also present, you can see that also in the 13th five year, and Professor James also there, and also in Alibaba and EU, and all this kind. I think this is the academic we need to do, you know. Another one is, <coughs> train a junior researcher, okay? For example, Tao Lu, he, he's now currently in Rossmore University, and he got a paper award and so on and so on. I think this is important, you know? And uh, Minzu is here, and he got an award and also teaching, and then Cindy also, Professor Xi Xiang Tong, the student in Tianjin, also receive all this kind, you know? I think this is very important for junior research. Training generally. So we need to publication and then international stand uh, excellent. We also need to disseminate and train. So next one, I will give to James, present about the government uh, you know, policy. Uh, I think the word's too small for everyone to anyone to read. So I try to uh, wrap up uh, as so quick as possible the part I've been uh, engaged in. Uh, actually, uh, the first part that uh, Professor Lee uh, presented is more about uh, the impact, global impact of our theme-based research, which produced a lot of papers as well as a lot of uh, uh, themes that cover. But th this one is more local to, uh, to try to give some suggestions to the local government to see if we can do something in this particular industry of uh, uh, port and uh, container port industry, how we can survive if it's not the, the, the right words to say because of the competition from uh, the nearby 
uh, ports and the cities. The fundamental issue here is that uh, after years of development, this part of the world as a uh, so-called uh, world factory has a regionalization of ports. That means there are several ports Many of them, uh, most or most major ports, run by some of the, or operated by some of the Hong Kong operators, which means a network operated by similar operators. They are not competing among cities, but competing among different operators in different cities. So in this situation, we see the price going down, the competitions intensified, and uh, when the factories move away from Hong Kong further away from Hong Kong or further away even from Shenzhen, then that means that uh, other ports gain a higher accessibility to the origin of the cargo. So Hong Kong is losing out in that kind of a, a sense of competitiveness uh, in terms of a cost. So what Hong Kong terminals operators do, what they did is since uh, uh, year 2000, they shift their focus from this kind of a land to sea transportation to a so-called transshipment. Water, we call it water to water transshipment. That means the uh, products from different parts of the China, different ports of China, going through Hong Kong to other countries. At the Hong Kong, they uh, change from the cargoes, the containers from smaller ship to bigger ship. The bigger ships are ocean going ships. So Hong Kong becomes transshipment hub. Up to now, up to today, we're talking about 70% 70, 70 of our throughput is transshipment. That means double counting of uh, one third of uh, our throughput. So Hong Kong now ranked, uh, drop, uh, the ranking dropped from uh, number one uh, 20 years ago to number five today because of the, uh, the, the nature of the uh, the source of the uh, cargo and uh, the role of Hong Kong as a transshipment hub. But if we reduce the double counting Hong Kong port in terms of uh, ranking should drop out of the top 10. So that means uh, something serious. We have to do something to see either we give up or we say it's uh, still important for Hong Kong. But if this is really important or not, if we look at the uh, road of Hong Kong uh, port to Hong Kong trade value by transportation, by mode of transportation, we realize that uh, the airport, the air cargo is more and more important. Now we're talking about 40% our, our Hong Kong uh, uh, trade value is carried out by the air, the air transportation. Only 28%, is, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, 18 uh, about 20% is carried out by uh, maritime transport. So land and uh, air are the two major modes of transportation today for Hong Kong. Because of that, and because if you look at the, uh, the, the percentage uh, of growth for the past 20 years, the air 400%, land 300%, sea only 13%. And then we see the transshipment going up, as I mentioned. And then if we look at the, uh, the uh, major ports nearby, we put three ports together, Hong Kong, Guangzhou, and, uh, and Shenzhen. We realize Hong Kong's port, uh, in terms of percentage dropping off, um, although still in total, it's about the same as Shenzhen. But we see that uh, Guangzhou ports catching up very quickly in the past 10 years. So we are going to see something like a one-third, one-third, one-third in probably three years of time. If we look at what I just mentioned, when we talk about transshipment, what the kind of a cargo going through Hong Kong, if we look at the two curves very parallel going up, that's land transport and air transport. So basically we are talking about the Hong Kong handling cargo from mainland China to outside the world or from outside the world to China. Both of them having a significant growth in air transport uh, and in land transport. So what, what I'm talking about, I'm talking about some, for example, African uh, merchants who carry uh, iPhones or fake iPhones, whatever, uh, from Shenzhen and they cross Hong Kong border and to the airport and carry big luggages to African countries. This is what we're talking about. Uh, but 
the uh, maritime transport, we see very steady and even uh, downtrend recently. So what can we do? Uh, how we estimate the relation between the trade and the port development, we have a one argument. That is, if the transshipment is going to contribute further to Hong Kong's economy in general, fine, we need to keep it. If it's only benefiting the operators or shipping lines, basically, why should we still uh, pay a lot of a, a, a kind of a attention to, to keep this business? Because we know Hong Kong is very expensive, Hong Kong is small. So by that, we try to look at the re-export trend and the inward transshipment of Hong Kong or you know, the relation between these two country by country, region by region to see if we have extra connections because of the transshipment, that means Hong Kong has better and more connectivities to other cities. Otherwise, it won't be connected. And because of that, we look at these relations. If Hong Kong gains from extra connectivity created by transshipment, and then we think we need to keep this role or even you know, try to support as much of, as possible. And then we look at uh, w within China, to China, to, uh, uh, to other Asian countries, to Europe, to uh, American, to uh, uh, North American, to Central, uh, South American, et cetera, how the trade and the cargo throughput related to each other by regions or even by countries. What we realized after calculation, we noticed that uh, actually there are related but not very uh, significant in terms of contribution to Hong Kong's economy. So what we conclude is, what we found is that maybe we need to support it, but we try to, re, uh, if, we, if, if it's possible, to lower the operational cost or the charge or the price to the users. And, uh, and also try to encourage some kind of a links between air transport and, uh, and uh, shipping. Because before it was not the case, these are totally two different kinds of cargoes. One we call time sensitive, the other one's time definite. Time sensitive go air because you need, uh, you know, you don't mind to pay a little bit extra, but you want to be delivered very quickly. But now we see after the very uh, quick growth of cross-border e-commerce, more and more we see this kind of mix of things shipped to Hong Kong and then fly to some other places, like that. And then we see probably we need to keep both, uh, keep the port in order to support this kind of uh, intermodal transportation, which require both port and airport, and Hong Kong has both as a hub in the region. Because of that, we then, um, uh, we, 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 personally, I involved, and actually I was asked by the Hong Kong government, the Central Policy Unit, to conduct a research to look at the, if the further uh, development of the port is possible, what kind of a, a things we can do. I made a suggestion to relocate the Hong Kong port from current location to another location. The reason are the reasons are two. The one reason is to lower the, uh, the cost of uh, operation uh, because we, we need to find a place which have enough space for uh, uh, empty containers, for example, for everything. And now the current location is too tiny and too narrow and too uh, surrounded by many other activities already. Second reason, the current location is extremely close to the CBD now which is only six kilometers from Kowloon, the center of the Kowloon. That means it's going to be very expensive. If we, if we make the land use change for some other utilities, like some other functions, like a commercial and residential, it's going to be very valuable. So moving it to another location means you, as long as we consider the, uh, the trade-off, it's going to be positive one, and then why not? Uh, of course, there must be some reasons for, uh, for this uh, not to be able to, uh, uh, to do for some constraints. Okay, now I move on. We move on to another area. Okay, so uh, this project is also uh, quite uh, big, and we also have some impact on, on industry. 
Um, so uh, we're taking a, a, a very uh, particular angle to, to attack this problem. So that is uh, the problem that we have seen in the ocean transportation. That's, uh, first, it's about the fuel price. As we know, the fuel price has been increasing year over year. And second, it's about the randomness. It's not like the airline industry. Um, the uh, transportation time in the um, in ocean is, is quite random. For example, this is a graph that shows how random the port time is. Uh, we're talking about one vessel um, port it, uh, um, at, at, at the port, and this is how much time it takes for the vessel to come in and, and going out. A third one is that there's actually a time money trade-off. Um, so if, if we have this uh, situation, what, what we can do? So time money trade-off I'm talking about is the fuel consumption. So one a vessel is behind a schedule. What we can do is speed up the vessel um, so that we can catch up to the schedule. But it, this is at a huge cost. Um, it's not like a land vehicle that the faster you're running at a vehicle and a slow and, and, and higher fuel efficiency. It's actually uh, uh, of this kind of shape, which means that if you want to gain a little bit higher speed, it's at a huge cost of the fuel. And this is not only like monetary cost, but also like environmental impact. <coughs> So the question is, what can, well, what can we do? Um, so we combine a lot of things, combine mathematic model, algorithm, and data. So this is the data that we have. We have uh, three years of data from a local company, from a, from a very big um, uh, ocean transport, uh, transportation company. And the data basically timestamp like each one, each vessel, uh, arrive and depart at each of the port and how much time it takes to dock in and dock out. Um, so, and then we also find some very interesting uh, phenomenon. For example, um, the time that it arrives and until the, the time it starts to load and unload boxes, it's, it's, it's quite uh, uh, random but follow a certain kind of pattern. And we're taking advantage of this kind of pattern. So we basically build mathematical models and using algorithm to uh, to come up with a, with a better uh, a schedule for uh, for for the for the service line. Um, so the question is uh, there are two kinds of question. First is a static question. That is, how are you going to create a static uh, schedule that says that one each of the vessel arrive at each of the port. And second one is more dynamic, which means that if you are behind schedule, what are you going to do? Are you going to be speed up or not? And uh, it's it's quite complicated because. None of, the, none of the transport owns a terminal. So if you are late, that, that means that you are interrupting the schedule. So when you arrive at a later time, you are at a lower priority. And then how are you going to take that into, into account? Um, so basically, there's a trade-off. And then we use mathematical model to capture this kind of trade-off. Uh, we also create a, a sort of um, a, a software that uh, the demo version of software to uh, to help uh, this company how to create a better schedule. Uh, this is how business was usually done. They, they actually have a team of people um, that doing this kind of spreadsheet calculation and everything's done by hand. And y we know that the, 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 the power the, of human brain to process data is really limited compared to computer. Uh, so what we, uh, we did was uh, to um, create the software. Um, it's a web-based application. And if you input the, the, the service route and all kinds of other factors, and we can generate a, um, a, a sort of near optimal. Uh, unfortunately, this problem, this mathematical problem is, is too difficult to find the exact optimal, but it, it, that's not a, that important. We find the near optimal solution. And so that the solution is way much better than the current solution that done by hand. And uh, we see that the, the, the savings, like we take one route, and uh, we run a simulation based on our schedule, and we see we find out that the, the savings on fuel consumption is about 11 percent. Well, of course, you may say that this is a, maybe a little bit like too realistic because this is only one line, a one service line. Um, well, we're thinking like our mathematical model is capable to extend to a service network, which means that you're not only just designed for one route, but also a network of service route and taking into account our transshipment and all these kind of factor. So the savings may be slightly uh, lower, but like we have like achieved the optimization on a like more global basis. So uh, with that, I would like to conclude my uh, talk and uh, hand it to Professor Lee.
Okay. So, see, I have only five more minutes. You know? So, I will go faster. And uh, people usually ask uh, what is TIS compared to standard project, you know, for, for the young researcher, you know. Usually, you know, if you are talking about GIF type of project, you probably don't have this holistic approach. You have more, more different team and then combine together and you are not able to deal with, I will share with you when in my project management experience, you know, okay? So, you know this one. Sorry, you know, if you are not, not Chinese, you know. Usually, you know, if you are doing the GIF, you are individuals, researcher, you probably will face this one, Jin San Si San. You only see the tree, you only see it's a forest, okay? If you are Christian, you know, the Bible have this one, and uh, actually means you think locally, work locally, okay? However, if you have seen this, you have project coordinated, you look all around, you have whole picture. So I spent about one year working with the industry, and then to deal with them and the whole picture of what's going on, whole supply chain, because only terminal operation doesn't work. You need to hold link. For example, two years ago, Hanjin in Korea, they bankrupt. All supply chain effect, all whole global effect. Okay? And so you need to go to the next one. Chen San Means what? You think global. Your whole picture now, you know what to do. However, if you have this one, can you do research? That's the question. Okay? For, for a sim based project, you have a team member. You got to find a project for the junior people who are senior or, or young researcher. So, you need to go to the next one. Jane Francis. Namely, it's single and local. Because you have a whole picture already, but they still need to find a problem, and the problem is motivated by whole picture. Okay? So, your problem is more realistic and more publishable. Because for them, you know, tenure, promotion are more important than doing the project. They don't, so I'm very happy, I have a very good team member and we work very nicely. So obviously, uh, you just ask us what new project, you know, we will continue. Although I'm retired, I cannot be a principal and investigator. We still need to do something important like emission type. And we are junior people, we have, Minzu is here, you know, we are all continue, you know, they are continuing doing this area. That's very important. Finally, if I have time, I want to share with you project management experience. Because if you are interested in writing this, is very important from the team. Obviously, you, know, you cannot do in GIF, you need to form the team. For example, I'm in the more terminal operation before, and we have supply chain group, we have system here. I didn't know Professor James before, until I want to form this team. So I, I look, uh, I find him, and then we have several meetings. Because he is a more policy type of group picture. So we need to work together, you need to find a team, and take time consuming, okay? Another one is academic industry. Academic and publishing industry, no. They are different types. So we need to work with them, and all my team members, maybe in supply chain, maybe traditional academic, so we need to take them to see terminal, to see the Hutchinson port. We need to see ocean container, uh, uh, ocean shipping, like OCL, and all the captain, and all this one need to take them. Another one is more like, we traditionally is in the transportation area and now supply chain area. Okay, you want to get into the new area, they don't know you. So you need to spend a lot of time to let another group understand you so you can publish. Because you know, when we submit a paper, supply chain area say, theoretically too simple. And then, modern type area say, not, in, not realistic enough. So how do you do? No, seriously, how do you do? So it, it is it's quite challenging, you know? Everybody say, oh, but, but actually it's a reality, you know? You, you got to face the reality. And then team seminar where industry, where industry uh, advisory board, we are very nice to work together, disseminate, train research. We are very happy, you know, okay? So, this is for junior people, you know. <laughs> you got to prepare, okay? When the chance comes, you can apply. I spent more than 10 years in terminal, but I never thought about team base actually. In the last minute, because I already prepared, I worked with the industry and then immediately, from the chamber, okay? So, 
So this is the last one. You know, thank you very much, and uh, we appreciate all my team members, we are excellent team, and all the industry people support. We are very, very helpful. You know, include Hutchison, OOCL, Hutchison, you know, the CEO, DHL, they, they're all very support. Actually, they form the industry advisory board, and that's very important. Every six months, we are meeting, and I think that's very important for, for project digest team base. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lee. Please come forward. Okay, uh, we have five minutes again. Uh, welcome all the questions from the floor. Yeah, th th thank you. Um, I I'm guessing that the optimization algorithms supply large traffic Mississippi, Rock, and so on. Have you actually done that? Allocation of investment and space for barge traffic on rivers is one question. The second question is, uh, some time ago I was in a port in Mexico. Security there was run by the military. And I had a long conversation about the different challenges of screening coming through there. And of course, they, regionally they had a terrible problem with human smuggling and all kinds of things. What is the status of security monitoring of the cargo shipping system, and how does it vary around the world? From my experience, there's a horrific scale of range of quality of inspection of cargo from various ports. I would imagine Hong Kong rates highly, but uh, is there value or an estimate of that? I personally view it that IATA do a better job in terms of calling the air industry. And I am all an uh, international maritime organization. You know, it's not the, as good as IATA, you know. So in terms of security, then for them, they, once they want to uh, wait the how weight, you know, the weight of the container, okay. And uh, it affect a lot of people. You know, they don't want to wait because every container you need to wait precisely because it affect the security. You know, so the in terms of security. Hong Kong, we have free port, yeah? So they, have the, they try to use IFID to trace long, about 10 years ago, but it's eventually you know, did it, okay? So in terms of security, maybe you can start I, I think more. in terms of container shipping security, there are several uh, devices now in place. One is the monitoring of the uh, loading process. Uh, for example, in China, uh, when you uh, uh, upload something into the container, simultaneously uh, all the loading process are watched by the other side from the consignee, like in the USA. So after that, it's uh, locked by G, uh, GPS lock, and then it make it safe uh, when it's uh, going inside uh, the port area, no matter where you move. So there's nobody can unlock that until uh, you get to the destination. Yeah, this is kind of a device that's now in use. And also, uh, Professor Lee mentioned the weight, the, the weight and other checks. For uh, Hong Kong being a, a safe place for transshipment, uh, I can say that uh, maybe, uh, maybe uh, politically in incorrect, I don't know. Uh, but for example, at the airport, everything, every people go, every person go to the US, triple checked every single luggage. Uh, when the U.S. have uh, had one single check before 911, Hong Kong already have double checked every single thing, now triple checked to USA. Yeah, yeah I, I have a, a, a quite simple question actually. I, when I see the statistics, it seems that uh, to me that if you compare Hong Kong to Shenzhen and Guangzhou, the market share shrinks almost every year. Guangzhou is almost catching up and uh, Shenzhen already surpassed. So Hong Kong has a remaining market share about 20 some percentage. So the general question is like, what is the remaining comparative advantage of Hong Kong if you compare Hong Kong to, to, to these competitors? You know, so. oh, okay. uh, that's something I missed uh, in my presentation. There's a one key element Hong Kong still has. That is we call it uh, cabotage advantage. The cabotage means that uh, along the coast, the uh, foreign ships cannot uh, loading and uh, unloading uh, from one port to another Chinese port along the coast. You have to uh, unload to another, I mean the transshipment has to be outside of the Chinese border in a port like Hong Kong or Singapore. 
Uh, this is a regulation applied to uh, most of the countries, including USA. So basically it means foreign ships cannot do that, this kind of transshipment from their own ship to another ship uh, within one single country in that country's two ports. What that means, that means Hong Kong port is now seriously protected by a policy from China. If China lift that policy, change that regulation, Hong Kong is dead very quickly because that the same thing can be carried out in Shenzhen and Guangzhou. So the uh, um, uh, Container Port Association of Hong Kong is extremely sensitive to this and they, they wrote a letter when China opened Shanghai port with this clause of a free trade zone allowing Shanghai as the, the only city that can uh, well, wipe out the, the, the regulations on set, uh, cabotage. And then they beat uh, a Korean like uh, Busan or Kaohsiung, some ports near Shanghai, all of them suddenly dropped like 20% their throughput because of that uh, regulation change. So we cannot bear this kind of regulation change here in the Pearl River Delta. So in some sense, that the Hong Kong did an excellent job when uh, 1995, you know, 2027 change, you know. One country, two system, but actually, you know, we more like one uh, different type of. In Taiwan, did a very large job because they have three link about 10 years ago. After three link, uh, Hong, uh, Kaohsiung uh, become more like international country. So they, they don't enjoy the, the, the capitalism. Advantage. That's a foreign policy problem, but from the management problem, I also want to share with you because I talk with the industry people, you know, they say Hong Kong's their advantage in terms of predictability. Predictability means time cost. If I go through Hong Kong, I know how fast, how many days, how much money. <laughs> in China, sometimes, of course, not always, sometimes it's very rare. So Hong Kong still have a good advantage in terms of management. That's why all Sierra was merged by, tried to merge by Costco. However, their stock price going high 100%, because Costco want all Sierra to manage it, excellent management. In around the world, I personally feel all Sierra and Musk are two companies I respect a lot, very excellent management. And that's why Hong Kong is an advantage. That's why we need to do the project to help. The project actually with all Sierra, I mean the, the, the project GM project with all Sierra. Uh, since uh, the time's up again, uh, thank you for all to uh, join us and, uh, in this particular session. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, uh, the new project will continue to support this kind of study for the Hong Kong's uh, four major pillow industries, including financing and uh, uh, transport. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee and his team.